almost 30 years since the assassination of President John F. Kennedy, only one person has stood trial for participation in that crime. This trial took place in the city that care forgot, New Orleans, Louisiana. item newspaper reporter noticed some unusual activity in and around the office of district attorney Jim Garrison. I saw some characters around Garrison's office that I hadn't seen before and nobody seems to know why they're there and what they're doing there. I noticed a private eye, a special investigator, a private detective coming out of Garrison's office and I was sitting on a bench right outside the grand jury room to see who was going in and who was coming out. Because that gives you a lead on what's possibly going on. When he saw me sitting outside, he said to me, and I'll never forget it, he said, Jack, they called you too? Things started with uh, Jack Dempsey, who was our a veteran uh, police reporter, and he kept hearing um, rumors around Tulane and Broad that the garrison was um, and it was investigating a conspiracy to kill President Kennedy. I walked down the hallway with him. He said, you think the guy's uh, crazy? Oh, I said, I think he is. And I didn't know who he was talking about, that he was crazy. He said, he thinks that the, event, that the, the, the assassination of Jack Kennedy, President of the United States, was hatched right here in New Orleans. And everybody ignored him uh, around the newsroom, and uh, he kept saying this, and finally... I saw in Jack column one Saturday that he had repeated this uh, in a very brief little item that said that the rumor around the courthouse is that Jim Garrison is investigating the assassination of President Kennedy. And I couldn't blame the editors for poo-pooing the story, you know, said, Jack, man, you know, cool it. Uh, that's, that's, that's idiotic. That's crazy. I said, you may seem to think that it is. I said, but there is definitely a story there. Believe you me. Uh, my feeling was that it was a news story if a local district attorney, regardless of what city, uh, if a local district attorney were investigating the assassination of the president, that was a news story in itself, just because uh, it really was a federal problem. I looked into the... Uh, expenditures of the uh, DA's office and found out that they were traveling to all these places at, like Dallas and California and spending a lot of money and uh, obviously something was going on. They had to be investigating Kennedy's assassination. They had to be. Why were they going to Dallas so many times, so often, three or four times a week? They were getting close. So then we put together a story um, that really I thought was kind of a nebulous story. Typed it up, sent it in, pulled it off the machine, wrapped it up, read it over, see it, I had made no mistake, put it in my pocket, and I said, I think I said a little prayer, man, let's make this front page, you know, exclusive, battle line. So the office got it, but they were still a little worried about it. They sent Rosemary James. I went to see Jim Garrison, who was part of my uh, beat anyhow. I saw him regularly, and I said, we have the story, we're thinking about printing it. Said, uh, Mr. Garrison, would you give me a comment on this story, please? He said, I have no comment. Well, if he had said no, of course, that would have ended it. But in fact, he wanted us to print the story, and so he said, no comment. And he threw it back at it. He said, who wrote this garbage? Who wrote this garbage? That was Garrison's exact words, according to Rosemary James. And she said, Jack Dempsey? He said, well, I, I might have figured that. In fact, all he had to do was say it's not true. Jack's, you know, he's flaky. He, you know, that's, that's not a word of truth in that. And if you use that story, you're going to be in trouble. And I've always 
believed that he wanted us to print the story. I didn't have any doubts about it, although later he would say, well, we printed that story and it ruined his investigation. Jim Garrison then held a press conference. Let everybody in. All the cameras have a right to be in on this. Except the door, too. Uh, yeah. The door running, please. Quiet! The Warren Commission, I want to state for the record, was constituted of honorable men of the highest character. I think the investigation, come to the point, was unsuccessful and is not complete. And that's where we came in. We have made progress, and there is no question in my mind but, which, but what there will be in time, arrests of individuals following our investigation. And there is no question in my mind but what in time to come there will be charges and there will be convictions based on the charges. He said, I know who plotted to kill the president. I know where the plot was contrived. I know the participants, I know who was in it, I've got all of the answers, and you just stick around and wait. If you want to stay here in New Orleans, he told the out of town media, stick around, the biggest story that you're ever going to work on. We're going to bring the culprits to trial. I know who they are. And that night, a guy by the name of David Ferry called, and he said, it's true uh, that uh, Garrison is investigating me. David Ferry was a pilot. Uh, an interesting weirdo. He was not your ordinary uh, all-American boy, so to speak. Yeah, he was always, uh, I think, trying to help people. He was always uh, a teacher. Uh, the man had a grotesque physical appearance. All his eyebrows were, were gone, his hair was gone, and they tell me he had no hair on his body. It's a medical condition called alopecia, which is a skin problem, which is absence of hair follicles in the skin. Not only he had no hair on his head, he had no eyebrows, he had no hair on his body. Not too many people have this condition. He had a little cadre of young men that uh, he taught how to fly in something called the Civil Air Patrol. In a way, he was a good old boy, but where uh, you know most good old boys would read uh, Esquire or something like that, uh, he read Scientific America. A lot of the, the witnesses that Garrison uh, called up for this trial were youngsters who had been uh, Dave Ferry's boys. Garrison tried to insert certain uh, uh, perversity, I think, into Ferry's makeup, which I think if you talk to the uh, scores of men and women who were in Civil Air Patrol, uh, you would probably get a different opinion. They were investigating him because they thought there had been a conspiracy and that he was to have flown the getaway plane. He was a pilot um, to Mexico or someplace. And he, he said, you know, I didn't, I'm not involved in any conspiracy, but he was really concerned. On February 22nd, 1967, just five days after Garrison's investigation was publicly announced, David Ferry was found dead in his Louisiana Avenue Parkway apartment. And he died, uh, my records show that he died from a ruptured berry aneurysm, which is like a stroke, a blowout of an artery in the brain. But uh, it's alleged that uh, he left a typewritten suicide note, which I don't have. Gentlemen, this is the much sought after note that I just read the first paragraph to you the other day. He was weird in his his living habits too he was drinking only co black coffee and and diet jello i mean this was this was his diet and it reads as follows to leave this life is for me a sweet prospect i find nothing in it that is desirable and on the other hand everything that is low when he had an aneurysm and died it's not surprising <laughs> that he died although garrison tried to say that he was murdered i have pictures of mr ferry showing the inside of his lip being badly bruised uh mr ferry was a known person who had hypertension all i got in return in the end was a kick in the teeth in fact the autopsy showed that he had an aneurysm he lived in such a way it's not surprising to me that he had an aneurysm Mr. Garrison discussed it uh, with me at the time. If someone who had hypertension and took a lot of thyroid medicine, could it precipitate 
a blowout in an artery in the brain. And I said, not only a blowout of an artery in the brain, but a blowout of an artery any place. Hence, I die alone and unloved. Uh, Mr. Garrison's thoughts at that time was that someone had passed a tube down David Ferry's, through his mouth, down through his esophagus, into his stomach, and pumped in uh, a large quantity of thyroid tablets. It was called Proloid. As you sow, so shall you reap. Goodbye, Dave. There was no sign of, of struggle, no, no lesions on his body, uh, no contusions, no bumps, no nothing, uh, other than on the inside of his leg. Uh, and I don't think he got that from being punched because it would have showed something on the outside. This had to be something that was traumatically inserted into his mouth. Although Garrison said he was his star witness, of course, and when he died mysteriously, you know, his case was wrong. That is, uh... Uh, what's so unfortunate about picking out an individual and putting his picture on the front of the paper and in effect implying that he's involved in the assassination when no law enforcement authority has mentioned his name or charged him or said a word about it. Later, of course, after uh, Ferry died, Garrison then decided to tell the press that this was the, one of the most important men in history. Of course, he only did this subsequent to Ferry's death. Uh, therefore, Ferry was never able to defend himself which made him a perfect target. What started out as a routine investigation of uh, possible local involvement of the assassination of uh, President Kennedy has uncovered certain facts which we consider extremely interesting. So I would say that the investigation is no longer routine, but uh, it is now extremely interesting. Ironically, Garrison had decided to arrest Ferry on conspiracy charges just hours before learning of Ferry's death. Chastened by the realization that he had waited too long to act, Garrison resolved to not waste any time making the next arrest. The alleged perpetrator turned out to be a most unlikely villain. Special reason for Mr. Shaw being brought in? Mr. Shaw. Why are you Shaw? Hey, Shaw. That's the movie name. Right. All right. We'll see you on the way out. Okay. Thanks a lot. Garrison's coyness was to be short-lived. If Clay Shaw had not been a familiar name before March 1st, 1967, that was to change forever. Assistant District Attorney coming out, followed by other members of the District Attorney staff who were telling all the reporters and television people to get on one side. Otherwise, they will not bring Mr. Shaw out. All right, please, let's go. Well, I think that everyone who knew Clay was in a state of shock. Uh, and I knew Clay. I'd interviewed him on a number of occasions. He was the head of the International Trade Mart. It's now called the World Trade Center. It was the head of Canal Street. And actually, it's a, it's a monument to Clay Shaw since he virtually, figuratively, and actually built it practically with his own hands. He was very tall and had white hair, bright blue eyes. And he was rather striking looking. And he certainly had, it was a head of, above everybody else because of his height. The first question by Jim Alcock of the district attorney staff has been, are all these men here members of the press? It's obvious they were that somebody in the group may not be a member of the press. They don't want a repetition of previous accidents such as occurred in Dallas, Lee Station bottom floor with Jack Ruby. He was not engaged, ever engaged, at least in my company and my seeing him, never engaged in any horseplay or, you know, tomfoolery. A socialite, basically. You'd see his picture in the paper. He was at all the diplomatic functions. I think he was rather well regarded. He was never married or anything, but... Uh... He was a social lion. He was invited everywhere. He was... Uh, always participating in uh, events to help the arts. Uh, he was a very, very intellectual man, great chess player, a writer. He had been working on uh, plays of his own. I, mean, I don't know how anyone could have found anyone to work for. He was a nicer, finer man than Clay Shaw. Now, his private life was his private life. Very debonair. Um, had sort of a, a gentle side to him and um, was so intelligent and, and artistic, knew an awful lot about art, um, but yet a warm person. I didn't, I didn't see that side. You didn't? As far as I'm concerned, he always kept his private life 
out of his public life, which was international trademark. And therein, I suppose, is another tale. No questions and don't stop it. I also learned that they had a search warrant for his residence uh, on Dolphin Street, I believe. Uh, and uh, Jimmy Alcott or Al Ozer, or one of the persons there said, Bill, we're shorthanded, will you come with us? And so I went on the uh, execution of the search warrant on Mr. Shaw's residence. He was a, a world traveler, spoke several languages, a writer, a playwright. He had saved enough money at this point in his life that he intended to retire early and spend the, left, uh, the rest of it writing. He, it was a very frightening experience. It was such a bewildering experience. It was, it was such an unexpected blow from left field, as they say when they speak about it. Baseball. A large kind of looming uh, man with big penetrating eyes and, and uh, a little bit bigger than life when he died. Oh, he did? Yeah. Um, it, looking ominous, but not being ominous. Oh. But I introduced Clay and Garrison at the elevator on the second floor of the trademark and made, and made some comment about uh, the tallest men in town and being five feet eight, and they were each almost a foot taller, you know, this, uh, I made some comment about the height, and they were very pleasant to each other. And Clay Shaw knew so many people from all over the world, and so when we go to his house, house on a Sunday afternoon for a swim, there'd always be somebody there from France, uh, maybe somebody from Spain, uh, different people that the kids would come in contact with, and they would hear that language, and that was sort of great. I mean, they would say, oh, those are darling little children. They wouldn't say much to them. But, you know, it, it was just a fun time that we had. A friend, a close friend of Chuck Morrison, who'd been mayor, what, three or four terms. Uh, Morrison later was, ironically, appointed by Jack Kennedy as ambassador to the American states, the Organization of American States. Matter of fact, one time, Clay introduced me to Tennessee Williams as Jim Garrison's PR man which was not quite accurate, and he only did it to tease me. So therefore, of all the unlikely people to be part of a, quote, conspiracy to assassinate the president. Meeting people had um, uh, sometimes outrageous ideas, or, or uh, you know, there was a talk about communism and all that sort of thing, and it was kind of fun to flirt with that sort of thing and, and dance around it, and uh, um, maybe not be a part of it, but to uh, be the moth around the flame a little bit. and. Uh, uh, to meet, um, I mean, I'd never met a lesbian in my life. I didn't even know for sure what it was. So after the titters died, and we realized that people were starting to come in from all over the world, all over the world, the carnival began. Shall we bond it out? Uh, if he wants to, yeah. Is this guy the Bible shot? Right. Yes, yes, yes. Hey. Shall I make a confession? No. There's been no confession. What? Uh, I know the answer to that, but I don't want to, uh, uh, you know, try the case this way. I know the answer. But I'm very kind, polite, uh, very interested in public affairs, and uh, and obviously, uh, and I don't question that. I mentioned it, obviously a man that uh, had served New Orleans well, and, and a man that uh, very many. Uh, 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 people in New Orleans call their friend. Well, interesting to talk to if you sit down and talk to him about business or about New Orleans. He loved New Orleans. I saw a different side of Mr. Shaw. Uh, and uh, by saying this, I, I don't mean to uh, intimate that because I believe Mr. Shaw was homosexual, uh, that that means that he was involved uh, in the death of the president, uh, nor does it mean that uh, it's necessarily bad. I was just recounting that they were not drawing the same picture of, of Mr. Shaw that I saw with my own eyes in that apartment. He conducted himself as a, a Southern gentleman. That's, a, that's all I can tell you about Clay Shaw. What had happened is we'd gone into the ground floor of the apartment, which was the living room. It was very well appointed, very well kept, a beautiful uh, French corner uh, apartment. Uh, it was the type of place where there was nothing out of, uh, out of order. A beautiful chest set, I seem to recall, on a glass coffee table there. And uh, we were looking around, looking in drawers there. And we heard this voice uh, from afar yell, Oh, shit, you want to see this? 
to be a, a respected businessman and to lead almost a double life um, uh, had to cause a lot of pain, I'm sure, and, and, and many times. It's certainly a lot easier now in the 90s, I suppose. So we broke our neck getting upstairs, uh, and uh, that was my first view of Mr. Shaw's bedroom. Uh, on his dresser were statue, marble statues of penises. Uh, in the closet were cat of nine tails, leather whips, uh, a lot of leather, uh, through his leather straps and all of that. People did not think about Clay Shaw as being a homosexual until Jim Garrison uh, started his investigation and started making allegations that, that there was uh, possibly some connection there. Well, and, and too, because of the Mardi Gras culture, I mean, they came out with, the press came out with all those whips and chains, but those were something that were used around Mardi Gras time as a costume. I think the thing that astonished me most, though, was uh, there were beams in the ceiling of his bedroom, uh, and there were two, I call them clothesline hooks. They were very large hooks that were not, did not make a complete eye. They had a sharp point on them, but they were very sturdy. I would say probably three-eighths of an inch round uh, hooks that had been screwed into the, uh, the beam. And the beam was white, and, and I would say that, that the two hooks were about 26 to 28 inches apart. And you could clearly see along the side of each hook, the outside of each hook, full handprints. Uh, and and they, they, were, they were significant enough that you could tell that many hands had been next to those hooks. But it was taken out of context. So it was made into something different. And people that really didn't know him didn't realize, you know. I don't, doesn't every New Orleanian have a few whips and chains <laughs> in their closet for God's sake? You know, all that old thing. <laughs> uh, from Mardi Gras Day. <laughs> and from what I saw, the, the logical conclusion uh, that I arrived at was that while Mr. Shaw may be everything that Mrs. James and other people thought him to be that he also had uh, perhaps a masochistic uh, side to him that, that those people were not, uh, perhaps had not seen, now, I'm sure probably had not seen. Shaw was released on a $10,000 bond, a singularly modest sum considering the enormity of the charge. Mr. Shaw, what, what would you say your philosophy of life is? What, what do you like to do with your life and what do you, what do you expect to get out of it? Well, I hope you got the rest of the evening. Uh, well, <laughs> not quite. No. <laughs> no, I, if I had to boil it down, this is back to this business of being liberal or conservative and putting uh, in a nutshell what would require a great deal of expansion. I would say that the successful life, the man who leads a successful life, the man who develops his potential to their fullest. Were you uh, speaking about yourself? Yes, yeah, of course. I'm, well, I'm speaking of everybody. I think this is my ideal of life, and I think this any man who develops all of his potential to their fullest and who makes it a policy to try not to harm anybody else based on those two principles, I would think that man has led a successful life. If he has a talent for doing something and neglects it, then he led an unsuccessful life with the amount of money he makes. If he, he, if he reaches the potential that is in him and harms no one or as few people as possible in this journey through this veil of tears, that I would say is a step of life for me or for anyone. Really. How will you rate yourself under that criteria? I do my best. <laughs> I think that's all there is to say on that. I try. Okay, so, I, uh, I think you described him in uh, the vaudeville terms as a class act. Very cool, very sophisticated man, extravagantly well mannered, and uh, self trained in a sense as, as a sort of. Uh, he could become the ambassador to the court of St. James tomorrow. And English wouldn't blink, blink an eye because he would fit into the world of diplomacy so beautifully. And yet he never graduated from college. Now the other part of your question is, uh, he was just kind of taking what was falling his way because it was unavoidable. I must have heard that a thousand or a million times. He must have something. And I used to say, yes, a headache. Garrison, you, you know, this guy, we, He's cold-blooded, has absolutely no feeling at all. I don't have a lot, but I have some. Well, Jim has never shied away from controversy. He seems to thrive on it. And uh, he's been in a lot of controversies and a lot of fights, and I admire him for that. Jim Garrison in 1967 
was perhaps the most powerful politician in Louisiana, certainly the most powerful politician uh, in New Orleans. He's the only public official in 28 years to give a damn about who killed the president of the United States and to risk everything in, in an effort to find out who did it and to tell the truth to the American people. My own personal feeling is he got into this perhaps well-intentioned. Garrison had a lot of good points, has a lot of good points. You know, who knows? Was there another assailant on the scene? I'm not sure, I don't know. You see, Garrison's, everything he did ever, ever since he was a DA was not whether it was true or false or made sense of it. Could he get away with it? That was his approach to everything. Could he make it work? Well, of course, first of all, <clears throat> let me remind you of the old saying that uh, one man with the truth constitutes a majority. I think uh, it would be terrible if he was, if he knew that Shaw was not involved, that he, as a district attorney, was accusing somebody falsely. I think that's, I uh, can't believe he would do that. I, I can't believe that he would be completely convinced that he was innocent and was just using that for other reasons. I think most district attorneys would not have arrested a man based upon the information that he had at the time of the preliminary hearing. I think uh, Garrison jumped the gun. Garrison is real keen, and he's got a lot of that stick to it uh, uh, quality that if he's on to something, hella high water is not going to interfere. And that as long as you sit in this office as district attorney of New Orleans, the law of the land will prevail here, which is that everybody is innocent until proved guilty. Well, um, we're going to try and do it that way. Uh. I was young at the time. Bill Wegman and Ed Wegman uh, had represented Clay Shaw in the past in a lot of real estate transactions, and I was a law partner of Bill Wegman. Edward Wegman was Clay Shaw's civil attorney. And when it became obvious to uh, Mr. Wegman that a criminal lawyer was going to be needed by Clay Shaw, he recommended to Shaw that Shaw retain me, and Shaw did so. When I was brought in to see Mr. Shaw, uh, I was given an opportunity to interview him in the men's room of all places because there was no other place that I trusted without having it being uh, bugged. In an effort to demonstrate the good faith of his prosecution, Garrison made the almost unprecedented decision to schedule a preliminary hearing for Shaw to take place two weeks after Shaw's arrest. I don't want to comment in any way on Mr. Shaw because uh, I want to lean over backwards uh, not to uh, infringe on any of his rights. So when I did get to see Mr. Garrison, um, we talked, and he said, Sal, all I really want to know is whether he'll take a truth serum or a lie detector test. And I said, uh, I, I know he wants to cooperate with the government, and you are the representative of the state government here. I said, but uh, aside, I can't agree to that just that quickly without knowing what's going to happen. I said, hey, he told me one day, he said, don't you realize this will put me in the White House? I said, yeah, the one in Jackson. That's the bug house, you know. I said, that's where it's going to put you. And I said, if you tell us what the questions are going to be about, uh, let us monitor those. Uh, let us have a day of rest so that the man can calm down. I said, uh, the media is out there looking for his neck. I've never, I've been a prosecutor, a lawyer for 25 years. I've never heard of a case where a Louisiana district attorney requested a preliminary hearing. Mr. Garrison uh, should be uh, commended for that. Uh, uh, although it was a bad tactic. Uh, I say commended to that by those who think that he was just acting on a whim or caprice. I said, you want to be a policeman? I'll get Joe Jerusalem to give you a big badge. You know, I tell him things like that. Well, he said, nah, those are ridiculous uh, requirements. We're going to charge him. So you have to do what you have to do. Uh, I don't think it was dealt with in a fast and loose manner, uh, which, of course, we are... We do enjoy in New Orleans. We enjoy frivolity. Mr. Shaw's situation was not dealt with frivolity. Uh, Jim Garrison thought he had conspired to kill the President of the United States. Uh, Mr. Lurie, explain me for his brain. It's kind of hard. The Hi. point I'm listening. Now, Mr. Chairman, the point is... Amidst mounting pressure from the press to reveal more evidence, 
and urging from some members of his own staff to gather more evidence, Garrison proceeded with the preliminary hearing for Shaw on March 14, 1967. At that time, the district attorney revealed his star witness, the confidential informant whose story linked Clay Shaw to the assassination conspiracy, a young insurance agent and friend of David Ferry's named Perry Raymond Russo. Russo testified that in September of 1963, he attended a party at David Ferry's apartment, where the assassination was plotted by Ferry, Lee Harvey Oswald, and Clay Shaw. Anytime there's murder, famous murder, anyway, you always got people showing up, admitting that they committed the murder. That was Perry Russo. Perry Russo uh, stuck with his story. Perry Russo was a, a liar, and he was always a liar in this matter. Garrison just recently, <clears throat> it was announced in the paper that he had been probing for some time in a conspiracy plot, and uh, during that time, he had secured certain names and certain information that would be, uh, that subsequently later on, he would arrest certain people in connection with the plot, which he knew to be evident. Nobody believed him. I really wonder whether the state's attorneys believed him. Perry Russo is a unique character because of his individuality. I don't think the man would lie if they put burning irons on his hands. And he's most, one of the most remarkable young men I've ever known. Well, Perry's still around. Um, you know, I, I just uh, do not say what I think I, of him. I was, I was happened to drop in uh, at uh, Ferry's apartment. There were several people there, you know, uh, several, seven or eight, I guess. I don't know, maybe a little bit more. People coming in and out. Uh, there was the usual uh, disarray in Ferris' apartment, and uh, these people were around listening to uh, I emphasize records, I think, uh, or uh, speeches of Kennedy, or, or tapes of Kennedy, or something, uh, and some Cuban uh, Spanish uh, tape. And uh, they began then to talk about either shooting uh, Castro or shooting Kennedy, one or the other. And if they didn't get Castro, let's uh, knock Kennedy off and uh, uh, blame it on somebody that likes Castro. Ferry was there, Oswald was there, uh, Shaw, but I didn't know Shaw was that name, was that name, was there. What name did you know him by? I named Bertrand. Russo's identification of Clay Shaw as Clay Bertrand was pivotal to Garrison's case. The district attorney alleged that Clay Bertrand was Clay Shaw's occasional alias. Dean Andrews, a New Orleans attorney, had first introduced the name Bertrand back in 1964 while being interviewed for the Warren Report. Dean Andrews was a clown. He, he was a buffoon. He had a genius for coining phrases and words as he went along, and he, was, he could constantly entertain you. For gosh sakes, I don't think Dean Andrews could conspire with anyone and remember it 15 minutes later. He was one of the last of the truly Damien, Damon Runyon-esque characters of New Orleans. There used to be a lot of characters like Dean Andrews in this city. Well, he was accused once of lying, and he said to someone in the uh, grand jury room, you call it lying, I call it huffing and puffing. The thing that strikes me about the whole Clay Shaw matter is when the focus came on Andrews, and Dean Andrews said, the fat man's got to go to his whip. His testimony before the Warren Commission is a scream. He kept on referring. When the Phoebes are on you, the FBI, it's like the plague, it's never ending, the Phoebes are rele and on and on, very colorful language, and I never knew what was real and what wasn't real. Dean Andrews uh, gave a deposition to J. Wesley Lieber, Liebler, one of the Warren Commission counsels about uh, Lee Harvey Oswald coming into his office in the summer of 1963, accompanied by some gay Mexican uh, from the French Quarter area. He claimed that he did represent Oswald at one time, that he was one of a bunch of uh, what he called Mexicanos who came around for some kind of representation, and that there was somebody in the French Quarter who sent these kids around to him. Of course, even though New Orleans was even then a rather open and liberal city regarding that lifestyle, it wasn't anywhere near as open as today, and uh, many people who did not want to come out of the closet used code words and code names. The name of the man that actually sent him, if anybody sent him, he later identified as someone named Gene. I don't see any point in giving his full name either. But uh, there was a Gene, apparently, who lived in the French Quarter and referred these people to, uh, to Andrews for representation if they got in some kind of minor scrape with the law.
Dean Andrews claimed that he had received a telephone call from Dallas asking that he represent Lee Harvey Oswald. Now, we didn't know if, if his mother had called him or if Oswald had a card with his lawyer's name on it and said, this is who I want to talk to. The FBI asked Andrews, uh, who asked him to represent Oswald? He didn't want to use the man's name any more than I want to use it now. And uh, he says that he, <clears throat> he used a name that had once been ascribed to this fellow, a completely fictitious name, by the name of Clay Bertrand. And of course, Clay Shaw's first name being Clay, and Clay being a rather unusual first name. When Garrison asked, who could that be? Somebody said Clay Shaw, nearly jumping. But Garrison didn't think there was anything <clears throat> funny at all in that. If that man really was Clay Shaw, using the name Clay Bertrand, then it would show a connection between Clay Shaw and Oswald at the time that Oswald had been arrested. He didn't believe in coincidences. There was no coincidences involved. If, if he, if Clay Shaw lived in the French Quarter and spoke Spanish, if, as uh, he did, he, was, he spoke Spanish, and he was well, he was believed to have had a circle of homosexual friends. Uh, Garrison made up his mind that this was Clay Bertrand. Violation of their duty. We are going to take steps to, uh, to have these people tell us all about the Clay Bertrand they located. Because the story was he was calling Sam Mugzeldin, who was a defense attorney and a friend of his, trying to convince Sam we have to go to Dallas to represent him. Oswald said he hadn't talked to his lawyer, and Dean had been his lawyer before, and Dean was always looking for a high-profile case. And then they asked him, well, who's Clay Bertrand, and what does he look like? And, of course, Andrews made up something completely out of the air about what Clay Bertrand look at, uh, looked like. And then the uh, FBI is on the street looking for him, and Andrews only goes so far with his joking. And he, he called the FBI and said, look, if they're looking for Clay Bertrand, he says, pull him off the street, he says, there isn't any play by train, forget the whole thing. Monk was in the Rollins Athletic Club when he said, uh, we have to go to Dallas, or you have to go to Dallas, I'm still in the hospital, they won't let me travel, and then Dean called him back, and Monk called him back later and said, forget about it, they shot our client. But he was watching television, as everybody was watching when Jack Ruby came forward and said, uh, and fired the shot. There is absolutely no reason that I have ever seen in anything I have read about this case to lead anyone to think that Clay Shaw was ever known as Clay Bertrand or that Clay Shaw ever sent any uh, clients to Dean Andrews. The two men never knew each other. Uh, or that Clay Shaw ever knew Oswald. Every one of those leads has turned out to be nothing. Shaw's defense counsel questioned Russo's credibility. First, there was the matter of Russo's own relationship to the putative assassin. Oswald, I met and talked to him once or twice uh, in 63 in New Orleans at Dave Ferry's apartment up on Louisiana Avenue. Uh, and Oswald was, didn't exist in my uh, mind until his assassination. But I heard, read, read about him in the papers, I heard about him on TV. We didn't have much to say to each other. He didn't like me, I don't suppose, and I didn't like him. Uh, I don't know anything about, uh, at all about Oswald. If he mentioned Oswald, I don't remember it. Clay Shaw's only indisputable link to Oswald, however tenuous, was Oswald's arrest in the summer of 1963 while distributing fair play for Cuba leaflets in front of the International Trademark Building where Shaw was managing director. I think it's interesting that in this city now, they will have a plaque, and thank God they do, where Jack T. Garden played his last job. They'll have a plaque where there used to be a bank but two of the greatest pieces of entertainment value in the past hundred years remain unplaqued. One is the place on Canal Street where there was the very first theater, movie theater, and the other one is just about 200 yards from it. That's where <laughs> Lee Harvey Oswald lived. Well, Oswald was from New Orleans. He went to work art school. He lived in Magazine Street. And you were always going to find people who knew him or who 
come in contact with it. That's where I lived, right up here. He went to this public library to get his book, and that sort of thing. I always wondered what his Russian wife thought about the whole thing when she was here. But, uh, My boss had been Ed Gillen, and Ed remembered that before all of this happened, he had met Oswald. Oswald just walked in one day and said, I'd like to talk to a lawyer, and was asking him certain questions. Uh, I'm not sure what they were. There's almost a perverse pride in the fact that Lee Harvey Oswald was associated with the world. They aren't proud of what he did, uh, but it's just another thing that the city can use to brag on itself. He had given up his citizenship, gone to Russia, uh, decided to work with the Russians, married a Russian woman, came back to the United States, and uh, these are all the ingredients of, of intrigue. Oh, but then. Oswald is improbable. I mean, what's he doing in Russia in the first place? You know, and all that kind of stuff. So there are things on both sides which are just questions. You know, you'll never can't figure out exactly why the people got where they got when they did. There's no doubt that uh, uh, Oswald knew and associated with David Ferry, for example, a well-known and rather notorious homosexual in New Orleans. Bert Hyde and I, my good friend Bert, who passed away, he and I went to the press club with a couple of cool ones after work one day, and there was a young man passing out uh, leaflets. And he had an, an assistant with him. Somebody else was helping him. And he gave me one. In my own research, I have uh, uh, interviewed several people who saw Oswald accompanied by Ferry at uh, the Napoleon House. Uh, bar and lounge in the French Quarter at Pontchartrain Beach. And I forgot what the leaflet said. That was just something about uh, Cuba, you know, free Cuba and this and that. I looked at it and it says, fair play for Cuba. I said, what? I said, what is this? And it was Oswald, of course. I didn't know who the hell he was at the time. In walks the man who later turns out to be Oswald. He came in and he said, uh, told our bartender, he said, may I have a glass of water, please? I rolled this thing he gave up and flipped it in his face. I said, why don't you get off this corner, you communist son of a bitch? You know, I or, or Bert Hart said, how about a beer? Would you like to have a beer? He said, no, thank you. I don't drink. He said, uh, that water will be fine. Please believe me, but thank you anyway. So I went outside and picked up this, uh, leaflet that I had flipped in his face, it was in the gutter, and I said, well, I'd better write a report. And he seemed like a nice young chap looking back at it, but boy, I remembered him as soon as I saw his picture in the paper later, that was one and the same man. And I wrote a brief report, just typed it out for Clay Shaw, or for the trademark executive office, and attached those two to it, assuming that one believes the witnesses that Garrison brought forth, I think that you could make a case that Clay Shaw, Lee Harvey Oswald, David Ferry knew each other, maybe drove around together in a black limousine. Throughout New Orleans history runs this thread of conspiracy, intrigue, and filibustering. Filibustering not like on the Senate floor, but to jump from there to saying that there was an actual plot to assassinate John Kennedy that Clay Shaw was a part of is carrying a, uh, to me, a question of guilt by association to its extreme degree. And the filibustering originated really in New Orleans. A filibuster was a man who got together with others in some dim lit cafe or maybe an upstairs room like Clay, Bertrand, David Ferry and so on, you know, dim lit and they decided, let's go knock Nicaragua off. Well, how can we do this? Well, I know a money man, or maybe a committee of money men. There's parallels. Why was he there? He said he wasn't. But why was he there that particular night? He's never buried an inch from, from uh, I've, I've been with him since then when he discussed it with other people. His, his precision in describing that occasion is, uh, um, and they sought to attack it in the trial with uh, cross-examination. It's very accurate. Despite Garrison's unflagging support of Russo's veracity, the district attorney soon came under fire for the manner in which his star witness's testimony had been elicited. 
Former Saturday Evening Post reporter James Phelan had gained Garrison's confidence by writing a laudatory article on the crusading district attorney some years before. An adult Garrison took Phelan into his confidence and unwittingly enabled the reporter to uncover inconsistencies in the state's case. Beginning with Russo's first official contact with the DA's office, an interview with Assistant District Attorney Andrew Mumu Chambre. Garrison had sent Chambre up to Baton Rouge where Russo was living at the time, and he had uh, interviewed him. And he'd written a 3,500 word memorandum about what Russo had said. Phelan noted that one significant detail was conspicuous by its absence from the memo. Nowhere in it did Chambra relate the conspiracy meeting attended by Russo, Ferry, Oswald, and Clay Shaw. He was very inexperienced, and that was part of the criticism of him. I remember Garrison saying one time when we had dinner that, uh, I like Mo. I said, he's, he's very new to this. He said, yeah, he is new. He doesn't know what can't be done. He hasn't learned that yet. That's why I like him. And that was an interesting concept, and, and that's strength. There's also weakness if you don't have some of the background, some of the experience, and he apparently left some material out of a memorandum. Maybe Russo didn't tell it to him at first, and maybe he told it to him later, and maybe he did tell it to him and he left it out, I don't know. Russo was a, uh, uh, was a fan of hypnotism, and he said, well, you know, maybe I can remember some more things if they hypnotize me. So I drove down to New Orleans, and then I met Garrison and uh, some of the other associates that he had around him, and then he asked me if I would stay in town for a few days, so they wanted to ask me more questions. They first they gave him sodium pentothal, which they call a truth serum, which it isn't at all. It simply relaxes your tensions, and uh, you talk you talk uh, more easily. Uh, unfortunately, if you fantasize, you fantasize more easily. Sodium pentothal, uh, to this day, uh, I think uh, uh, experts feel that uh, under a proper dosage of sodium pentothal, uh, uh, inhibitions are uh, removed and that people may talk uh, more freely and easily uh, uh, under uh, a proper administration of that drug. They uh, had him hypnotized by a family doctor there by the name of Edmund Fatter. Fatter had been briefed by the district attorney's office uh, about their ideas about the thing and he, uh, he plainly uh, prompted uh, Russo, for example, he said, the, the white-haired man is there. And, uh, uh, and Russo didn't respond to that. And then he went on to uh, the Ear and Ferry's uh, apartment, and uh, there's a Oswald there, and uh, the white-haired man, they're talking about assassinating somebody. I don't see what uh, Shambert did, which was wrong. The, uh, Generally, these cases, district attorneys do a lot of things. As I've been practicing law for 41 years and mostly as a defense lawyer, and in criminal cases, always as a defense lawyer, but also some civil cases. And what district attorneys do is basically they take the witness and they throw him against the wall, literally or figuratively, and say, we want your cooperation. You're going to be in a lot of trouble if you don't do this. Garrison staff was not doing that, as far as I can see. But Garrison staff was operating in a goldfish bowl and in, the, and in an environment which was extremely hostile. Under hypnosis, uh, Russo came forward with, uh, with the story for the first time. It wasn't in the interview with, uh, uh, with the Chambre. Not a word about it. 3,500 words, nothing about a conspiracy to kill Kennedy. Nothing about uh, Shaw having met uh, Ferry or Shaw having met Oswald or any kind of a party. Uh, at uh, Ferry's apartment, and it stunned me. We started off with uh, the naive intention of uh, requiring witnesses to take the objectifying test in order to assure ourselves that there was no question about the truth. Uh, almost immediately, to our astonishment, we found that uh, when we used the truth theorem and hypnosis, that it was uh, used against us. And we were suddenly described as monsters hypnotizing the witness. Surely you don't live such a, an exciting life that you have to be hypnotized to uh, remember that you sat in while three people plotted to kill uh, Jack Kennedy. 
I can only say nothing that I ever saw Garrison do or say indicated to me, uh, one, that the, a polygraph uh, and sodium pentothal were administered at his direction. I've never heard that. Maybe they were, but I've never heard that. Uh, and two, that they were administered for the purpose of getting Mr. Russo to say, state some untruth. At that point, we said, uh, forget it. Uh, in other words, there's no use wasting our time. If, uh, if they think our efforts to objectify our witness uh, are something sinister, then we just don't have time to fool with it. So we give lie detectors now to uh, witnesses we think are lying in the usual way that other jurisdictions do. Apparently, people are happier when you do it like that. Yeah. Well, there's one question I got, Mr. Garrison. Why did they think that Perry wouldn't go to the FBI or even go to uh, the district attorney and, and tell them what was going on? And uh, Garrison looked at me and says, Jim, that's a good question. There's an old saying comes back. As a matter of fact, it's from a, a New Orleans writer's novel of some years ago. Uh, William William March, William Campbell wrote it under the name William March with Bad Seed. But one of his novels, he tells about uh, October Island. He tells about, uh, here's a great line, about somebody witnessing something that nobody thought was being witnessed. And he says, in effect, there's always somebody sitting under the oak tree. Well, in this case, it was Perry Russo, and in their attitude, I think, was he just a kid. When he had Clay Shaw arrested, he did that on the strength of Perry Raymond Russo alone. And that's it. And guts. Russo got up and told this whole story that had been developed under hypnosis, and he got up and held his hand over Clay Shaw's head and said, this is the man that was present there. And uh, they, uh, the three judges ruled that there was sufficient evidence to hold uh, Clay Shaw to trial. What do you like about New Orleans? Why do you stay here? I like, well, why do I like about New Orleans? It's a city that has a very, a very um, ambient, a special character and flavor of its own. The case of the state of Louisiana versus Clay Shaw commenced on January 29, 1969, almost two years after Shaw's arrest. Some time ago, you said in the Petroleum Club, we have solved the assassination, we know who did it. Do you still stand by that statement? Well, there's no question about that, but uh, we have a small... Uh, problem of corralling all the evidence uh, in order to be able to go into the courtroom. I would say that the whole trial was a great American tragedy. Since that is uh, the subject coming up in court next week, I'd rather invite you to next week's show and see the answer. What did you say, Sam? I know the first several weeks was taken up selecting the jury. I recall that we went through a panel of about, I think it was a uh, 1,666 prospective jurors before we finally got a panel, which eventually sat on the case. I remember the jury was sequestered. That is, even though it was not a capital case, it was sequestered in the Quality Inn on Tulane Avenue. One more question. Uh, are they allowed to watch television as long as they don't watch the news? That is correct. In each room, there is a sheriff monitor and a radio and a TV. If anything comes on about this case, he flips it off. Did I get the paper with uh, this case cut out? Well, then they could get the daily papers with this news of this case cut out of the chair. Thank you. I don't think it was a circus at all. I think there was very serious business going on in court. The linchpin of the state's case continued to be Perry Russo's assertion that he had witnessed Clay Shaw conspire with David Ferry and Lee Harvey Oswald to assassinate the president. Early in the trial, Garrison introduced new evidence that he hoped would link Shaw to Ferry and Oswald. Well, the Clinton, West Feliciana parish witnesses were the ones who formed my opinion for me. Um, I, my family has roots in West Feliciana parish, and I know those people very well. Uh, Shaw ended up with David Ferry in a small town of uh, Clinton, a small leftover from the days when Cotton was king, and uh, just north of Lake Pontchartrain and slightly west. 
The Clinton witnesses testified that in late summer or early fall of 1963, they had observed Lee Harvey Oswald standing in line at a federally sponsored voter registration drive in the center of the East Feliciana Parish town. Oswald had apparently sought employment at the state mental hospital in nearby Jackson, Louisiana, and had been told that his chances of being hired would be enhanced if he were registered to vote in the parish. The witnesses further testified that while Oswald waited in line to register, two men they identified as David Ferry and Clay Shaw waited outside in a black limousine. The witnesses who took the stand and in statements ringing with truth said that Clay Shaw had been in that territory with Lee Harvey Oswald. When Clay Shaw drove a really flamboyant roadster, white as I remember, with the top down, and when they made their, their appearance in Clinton and St. Francisville, they were really making a statement and they were not forgotten by those witnesses. It was not Clay Shaw. You know, Clay Shaw, uh was a very easy person to identify, but this was supposed to have happened six, seven years before. And everybody had seen Clay Shaw's picture in the newspaper and television, etc. So there, maybe there was a similarity, maybe there was somebody there who was in a black limousine, who may have been with a David Ferry or someone like that, or a Lee Harvey Oswald. The defense reeled from the testimony of the Clinton witnesses. Garrison next called to the stand another person who claimed to have seen Shaw and Oswald together, New Orleanian Vernon Bundy. He testified that he was out on the seawall, kind of like Pontch Train. And he was about to shoot up some drugs. And had witnessed Clay Shaw and Oswald in a brief conversation, something passed between them. Shaw so ended up uh, hearing Lee's troubles with his wife and ended up giving him some money, in effect telling him to calm down. And uh, when, uh, when Lee also put the money in his, uh, in his pocket, uh, a, a piece of yellow paper fluttered to the ground and he walked in one direction when he split with Shaw. Shaw walked back to his black limousine from the International Trade Mart and he picked up and wrapped some of his excess drugs in this flyer. And he looked at it and it said something about Cuba. On the end of the one of, I later found out they were yellow pamphlets. One of Lee Oswald's Fair Play for Cuba pamphlets. And it struck me as very rare, and obviously the jury didn't buy it either, that a man who lived in a big rooming house with a half dozen bathrooms would go out on the seawall to shoot himself with drugs. There used to be a, a, a boxing bar not too far on Poitras Street, and it seemed like all of the characters that ever walked into that bar were involved in this case at some time or other. I mean, it's that same type. Damon Runyon would have loved it. The most dramatic event I remember from the trial is when Bundy put his hand over the head of the person who he said he saw uh, having his transaction by the lakefront. And, uh, and I remember seeing, you know, Clay Shaw afterwards when they had a break, you know, and he was seeing this in the, you know, in the hallway, taking a smoke. And he just sort of shrugged his shoulders, like, you know, it's like, what do you expect? When you're involved in, in criminal suspects, the people you're going to get to testify are going to be other people involved in that type of uh, milieu. You're not going to get the priests or nuns to come forward and say, I was talking with this uh, gangster or something. You're going to get people in the... Uh, in that type of uh, situation, and they're gonna have sordid backgrounds. After the testimony of Bundy and the Clinton witnesses, Garrison had reason to believe the jury was leaning toward a conviction. By all appearances, the next witness would be the state's most credible so far. Charles Spiesel, an accountant who worked for a tax return consultation firm in New York City, testified that in May of 1963, he traveled to New Orleans to visit his daughter, a student at Louisiana State University. Charles Spiesel was on the stand, and Charles Spiesel was a challenge to a court reporter. He talked so fast. He was testifying under direct examination and was doing a terrific job. He had said something about him being at a party on Espinade Street, which had been attended by both Ferry and Clay Shaw. 
and uh, he was very credible when we heard him. And then they had a recess, and then Irving Diamond, who's a fantastic criminal lawyer, then he started on his cross-examination and completely destroyed him. Most of that was arranged by Sal Panzica. While he was testifying, uh, I got a phone call from my next door neighbor, and I was reluctant to take any phone call during this important trial, but I took it anyway. And uh, he told me, he says, I have to tell you about this guy I just heard on the radio who was testifying against Shaw. And he said, uh, this guy's a nut. I said, well, how do you know this, Bill? His name was Bill Storm, my neighbor. And uh, he said, I worked with him for almost a year here in New Orleans in an accounting firm. And uh, he, he hears voices. The uh, defense counsel um, said, in effect, now, Mr. Spiezo, uh, isn't it a fact that uh, your daughter goes to LSU? And he said, yes. And he said, Mr. Spiezo, isn't it a fact that when she leaves, every year when she leaves for LSU, before she leaves, you take her fingerprints? Oh, yes, I do. And isn't it a fact, Mr. Spiezo, when she gets back, you take her fingerprints again? Oh, yes, I take her fingerprints when she gets back. And he says, why do you do that? He says, well, I want to compare them and make sure she's the same girl I sent to LSU. And he talked about having been hypnotized by the New York police so many times. And I thought that was odd. He thinks people are uh, eardropping on him while he walks down the street. He says the trees have microphones hidden in them. And he, uh, he has filed suits in New York against the city of New York, the state of New York, for uh, invading his privacy. <laughs> of course. When he said that, I envisioned that whole case flying out the door like a window like a giant turkey. But what are you going to do when somebody, that thing happens? That's what happened, and that was one of the holes in our case. By the time he left the witness stand, uh, he was really the laughing stock of the case. And many people, including myself, uh, really felt sorry for the man because he obviously didn't have all of his marbles. Well, they discredited him otherwise, but the building he picked out on the second floor was a building that Clay Shaw was refurbishing. So how that man could come down here and pick this building out, of all the buildings in the city of New Orleans, it was the building that Shaw had something to do with. And it could possibly, he had a key to the room. Or other. So a lot of people didn't pay attention to that, but I thought that was a very important piece of evidence. Garrison always said that somebody gave the information to Diamond, and I talked to Diamond recently, I had coffee with him, and he says uh, he had contacts in New York, and they found out the man's name either that day or the day before, and they had been searching his file, and they said it wasn't hard to find, you just look up the newspaper clippings, they call the police, and they've got a rap sheet. This guy's been in, I think, Bellevue, whatever the hospital is, and uh, he's, he's certifiable. Tom Bethel. Uh, who was our archivist, uh, uh, left in the black of night a week before the trial, and, and Mr. Diamond and his team can say what they want, but Tom Bethel went directly to the defense team and gave them our entire trial be brief. And I'm the guy he gave the list to. And uh, Tom and I became very friends, but Tom was a very sensitive human being and a very bright one, and he just saw what was happening to Clay Shaw, and he, he got nervous about this. He came down here to work in this case because he thought it was it was one that was a valid one. It was not. So uh, Tom gave me the names of a few people in the Clinton area and the Kentwood area, and that's all. He taught us a great lesson. I, I sum it up the, the whole case up by saying it's almost impossible because of the resources of a, 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 a national intelligence agency for a state prosecution to be successful. But Garrison seems to think that. All of the defense team, including Tom Bethel, who was not part of the defense team, he thought that we were all connected with the CIA or the FBI or somebody. And I've never got a check from the CIA in my life. If it is coming, I'd like to know when. It's a little late. Clay Shaw's trial lasted a total of 42 days. During one extended stretch, his name was scarcely mentioned as the state focused on the events in Dallas, leading some of Garrison's detractors to claim that Shaw was being used as a conduit for criticism of the Warren Report. Perry Russo testified for two full days, 
Under withering cross-examination from Irvin Diamond, Russo equivocated but recounted essentially the same story he had told while under hypnosis some two years earlier. Clay Shaw testified that he had not known David Ferry or Lee Harvey Oswald, had not been present at the party described by Perry Russo, and had never used the alias Clay Bertrand. Shaw also denied that he had ever met Charles Spiesel or Vernon Bundy, and refuted the allegation that he had been in Clinton or at the lakefront on the days in question. Jim Garrison was absent from the courtroom for much of the trial, but delivered a closing statement. In the 25-minute speech, a savage indictment of the federal government, Clay Shaw's name was mentioned only once. I still remember one thing that I said in my closing argument that I strongly feel today, and it really gives you a good idea of what I think of the case. You could take everything that the state offered in evidence as the gospel truth, and it would not have been enough to convict Clay Shaw. If the state didn't put on any evidence at all, he wouldn't have seen fit to put on a case himself. He would have rested when the state rested. That's what lawyers do, you see. So he's, uh, I, I love Irving Diamond, but he's, he's uh, uh, involved in rule aggrandizement, I believe. <laughs> I don't think Garrison ever believed that the government would allow the case of uh, people of Louisiana against the, uh, Clay Shaw to ever get to trial. He was quite, and he said that to me on more than one occasion. I think there's a difference between the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And I don't think the papers have told the whole truth. Garrison uh, was, was very ill at the time. He had a very, very bad back. I, I tell you, Jim Garrison is a thinker. I have respect for his mind. I don't believe Jim Garrison is a trial uh, expert as, say, Irvin Diamond was at that time, or as Jim Alcock was at that time, or as Al Oza was. I remember that I went to visit him at his home during the trial. I was there with Mort Saul and Garrison was in his bed. He, he couldn't move his back, it was so bad, and he said, gentlemen, I'm sorry, I have to go to the bathroom, and he couldn't stand up. So he put himself off the bed, and, and he fell on the floor, and then on all fours, he started crawling in front of us to the bathroom. He couldn't stand up, and he realized it was an unusual scene, and he looked up at me, he said, Mark, you're probably having difficulty this moment looking at me and realizing you're looking at one of the most powerful men in the state of Louisiana. That everybody was waiting for Clay Shaw to fall apart, to be torn apart by cross-examination, and he was not. The jury took a little less than one hour to reach a verdict. They handed it down shortly after midnight, March 1st, 1969, two years to the day after Clay Shaw's arrest. I didn't know that two of those jurors were stubbornly insisting on guilty as charged. Nobody ever told me. I guess they thought I knew it. So it was ten to two, two for two for, two for guilty. But uh, uh, but the other ten, as as you probably know, concluded that we had shown that there, that there was a conspiracy to kill John Kennedy, but uh, that we hadn't been unable to to completely prove uh, um, a reason for Shaw's participation beyond a reasonable doubt. When a jury rules and the appellate process is finished. When the jury rules, I accept it. The jury said, Clay Shaw was not guilty. I accept that. If you're any kind of a court reporter, with years of experience behind you, and having heard, regrettably, perjury, uh, you get to recognize a, a lying witness, and the mouth goes slack and the witness tends to put his hand to cover his mouth, and I thought Clay Shaw was guilty of perjury, but I'm perfectly willing to accept the jury's verdict that he was not guilty of conspiracy. I, as lawyers like to say, no use beating a dead horse. Shaw's magnanimity, I think, was evident in the way in which he managed to survive during that ordeal. For example, he, uh, he wrote a diary, but instead of writing a diary, as most people do if they write diaries before he went to bed at night, he wrote when he got up in the morning, he said that was the worst time. He had to get over that. And you can imagine. 
people should put themselves in this position because much like the people who suffered under McCarthy, whose, whose reputations were blemished the minute they made headlines for McCarthy, he walked around, <laughs> as he said, wanting to say, I didn't kill Cock Robin, I didn't kill Cock Robin. It was only later that a lot of journalists who were involved in covering the investigation came to believe that Garrison was abusing the very considerable power that uh, the New Orleans District Attorney's Office has. I had often thought of Clay Shaw as a, as a Kitty Genovese character written very large. As, as I saw the case progress, I kept thinking, I kept wondering, when is somebody going to step in and put this to an end? This guy doesn't have anything to do with the Kennedy assassination, and Garrison keeps using the power and the discretion of his office to continue to harass this guy. Jim Garrison was the first public official in the United States, as far as I know, to publicly express not only criticism, but vehement disagreement with the lone assassin conclusions of the Warren Commission and Garrison publicly, in effect, called the federal government a liar, accused the government of covering up the truth about the Kennedy assassination. I remember one day in that office on Tulane Avenue, he came out of his office and the press was surrounding him. As you know, Jim is six foot six, and they surrounded him, but they're beneath him. And uh, Jim said, uh, in that stentorian and remarkable voice, he said, uh, ladies and gentlemen of the press, I have some bad news for you. Your central intelligence agency killed your president. The tremendous amount of publicity that Garrison generated helped a great deal towards increasing public disenchantment with the Warren Commission, increasing public suspicions of a conspiracy in the assassination and a federal government cover-up. He was the knight on, on the white horse and did things in New Orleans that were just weren't done. I remember I was in, <laughs> in New Orleans one time for an interview, something like we had in here, and they said, we got to interrupt this, that Jim had just read, read the house of prostitution right near City Hall or something, in some, or maybe a police station. And they said, we've got to get that. That's the kind of flamboyant thing that he did. And, and so many times he was absolutely right. Well, Garrison was already inaugurated as district attorney by the time I came on the scene as a news person. Um, and people weren't taking him too seriously because no one had ever taken a district attorney in New Orleans seriously before. He wasn't just your ordinary garden variety, run-of-the-mill district attorney. He was an imposing figure, he was creative, he was imaginative, he was articulate, uh, he reminded people of Perry Mason. Jim Garrison has probably the greatest knowledge of big bands, and I'm talking about obscure big bands, that I've ever run into in my life. The Oren Tuckers, the Little Jack Littles, uh, Blue Steel in his orchestra, people who may have made one or two 78s, but that he li used to listen to on radio broadcasts throughout the United States. He used to sit with his ear to the dial when he was young. I know I've heard him sing, he can only sing one song, You're the Cream of My Coffee, and I've heard him sing that quite a few times. Uh, then I remember when he became district attorney and he started cleaning up all of the places on Bourbon Street, I kind of scratched my head because I was well aware that he used to represent an awful lot of the people on Bourbon Street. Reporters began to find fault with Garrison, what he was doing here and what he was doing there. And he lost the Mr. Clean and became instead the Jolly Green Giant. Do you think you'll, uh, do you have confidence about this one? Do you think there's any foundation to what the, the district attorney is uh, saying? Clay Shaw is facing another trial. On March 1st, 1969, in a unanimous verdict by a 12-man jury, Shaw was found not guilty of charges that he conspired to kill the late President John Kennedy. Two days later, District Attorney Jim Garrison personally signed a bill of information charging Shaw with perjury. Kelly Russo, in his testimony, 
sir, that this alleged meeting up in Perry's apartment was nothing more than a bowl session, that he witnessed no conspiracy and didn't see any conspirators. It's our contention that that testimony for which the state vouches, having put Rousseau on the stand, reduces the importance of any statement that Clayshaw knew Oswald or Perry to the point where it does not come within the purview of Article 123 defining perjury. Since that time, Shaw and his attorneys have sought to have the perjury charges dropped. Today, they went before criminal court judge Malcolm O'Hara for his ruling. The judge said that Shaw will have to stand trial on the perjury charges. After the ruling was pronounced, Chief Assistant DA James Alcock asked that the trial be set for January 18th, and Judge O'Hara tentatively agreed to that date. This is not the last word, however. Shaw and his attorneys say they will appeal to the Louisiana Supreme Court. They contend that the jury which tried Shaw on his conspiracy charges also ruled on the credibility of his testimony. The best light I could put on his, his investigation, the very best light I could put on it, would be that he started out with good in intentions, uh, got nowhere, but got to enjoying all the national publicity and decided he had to figure out some other way to keep all that going. And that Clay Shaw was just the right person to keep all that going because of his stature. The federal court enjoined the district attorney from prosecuting him for perjury. There are a number of things that I believe that Shaw testified to that I did not believe. I believe he was lying to the jury. Of course, the jury probably believed him. But uh, I think Shaw put a good con job on the jury. That's my opinion. He was a man that was uh, uh, held up before the world and as the perpetrator of the crime of the century. Went through an enormous ordeal, basically ruined him financially and otherwise. Uh, I took it on myself, and I was not prompted by anyone to try to do something to make it up to Clay Shaw. He was towards, I think, uh, if I'm not mistaken, at least 13 buildings in the French Quarter, and his action then spurred others to follow in his tracks and little by little the quarters became what it is now the most sought after desirable most valuable piece of real estate in the, in the city and one of the greatest pieces of real estate in this country appointed him i think it was to the french market board he lived in the french quarter he something that he he truly loved and uh, it was that board that uh, looked after uh, various aspects of the French Quarter, limited aspect, but nonetheless very important aspect of it. Uh, which was a kind of way of saying to the government, look, it's over with, okay? Can't undo what has been done, but the government, uh, you know, feels sufficiently about your innocence that we're prepared to have you serve the public again in this, in this position of trust. I think that what gets lost in the shuffle about the Kennedy assassination is the innocent people that have suffered. And Clay Shaw has to be at the top of the list. He was a, a curiously interesting man. And uh, during all the time, uh, in spite of the uh, ravaging effect which I necessarily took on his life, I wasn't happy about that, but I had to do it. Nevertheless, occasionally our eyes would meet from time to time in the courtroom and things like that. And it was always a courteous nod from him. And it was kind of a, I suppose, a mutual thing. So I didn't glower at him and we passed in the hall or something like that. And he'd nod hello. So he's a remarkably civilized man. So many God has called our brother Clay from this life to himself. We commit his body to the earth from which it was made. Christ was the place to rise from the dead. And we know that he will raise all our mortal bodies to be like his in his own glory. Uh, he died shortly after, and sometime in the summer of 1974, when I first took office. And we knew he uh, had been in Ashna, had cancer of the lung. He was a heavy smoker. 
and he went back to the quarter to someone's home, I guess, and he died there. Well, no one let anyone know that Mr. Shaw had died. We got an anonymous phone call through a local newsman that there was a vehicle was seen and witnessed driving up to Mr. Shaw's residence. A dead body was removed from the vehicle, brought into Mr. Shaw's residence. An empty carry-all was carried out, put back in the vehicle, and the vehicle drove off. And for those three reasons, we instigated this investigation. He died, and he was buried within six or eight hours in Kentwood, Louisiana. The next day, the news media was notified, and someone called me and told me. Well, I called his, uh, his uh, doctor, a doctor from Ashna, and I said, don't you think you should have reported his death to the coroner's office? Uh, even though it was a natural death, uh, and the law says if it's a natural death, it doesn't have to be reported to us. But here's a guy who was accused of assassinating the President of the United States. And it seemed to me he was made such a public figure by these accusations, whether they were true or not, and he was certainly found not guilty. I said, don't you think you should have called? And he said, well, my attorney said there was no reason, and he hung up. Do you have any proof that the body that may have been brought into Mr. Shaw's apartment was his, and he may have died someplace else? We have no proof of anything now, but uh, the police are now investigating all possibilities. And so I said, but Irvin, don't you think that, that uh, you know, to, to make everybody lay at rest, I mean, don't you think we should have just been told about it? I could have signed him out as a cancer of the lung, you know? No, and he said, no, I, I don't believe it. I said, well, we have a difference of opinion. I said, I'm going to get a court order and exhume his body, and I'm going to do an autopsy on him. Have you discussed this at all with Mr. Garrison? No, this has nothing to do with Mr. Garrison. This has nothing to do with my being a scavenger. This has nothing to do with anything except upholding the duties of this office. I got calls from everybody saying, please leave the man at rest. I got a couple of threatening phone calls that I'd be sorry if I did that. So we talked it over with everybody and we didn't pursue it. Let me say that the day will come when everybody in the United States, as well as everybody in the world, will know that it was in New Orleans that it was found that the murder of John Kennedy was faked and the United States government was involved in the murder and that we were right about it. And we are not going to back off of that because we were right about it. I'm satisfied that we did what we had to do. We were absolutely right because later evidence that came along indicates more firmly that uh, Shaw was with the agency and we were being fooled like everybody in the country when the agency director said he was, he was not connected with the agency. And uh, we darn near got the agency by the big toe on that one. I myself don't think he had anything uh, in particular, but that's the common uh, response you get to any kind of hearsay or uh, accusations or rumors. Where there's smoke, there's fire. It's one of the most uh, erroneous and devastating kind of uh, homilies and sayings that you can run across. Most of the time, where there's smoke, there's not fire. Not being a native New Orleans, I suppose that my initial reaction to his burlesque or script tease style of sort of prosecution by press conference uh, just appeared to me to be legally irregular. Perhaps to Garrison it was simply second nature, that that's the way things are done down here. You have to build these things up to a climax. Mr. Garrison, if you had it to do over again, would you launch another investigation? Uh, yes, I would have to, because uh, once you know that something was hidden, once you know what happened, then you have no choice. But I would say that uh, I would do it with uh, a great deal of reluctance, because it never occurred to me that so many people would take it for granted that I would lie about such a subject. New Orleans is a charming place, uh, as long as you play the New Orleans game. If you go down there for the Mardi Gras, you can have a hell of a time and so on. But I regret having to say this, I wouldn't live there under any circumstances. I'd dig me a cave up in Montana before I would uh, get into a system that could permit 
a man like Garrison to function, and then eventually electing uh, to a judgeship. In the final analysis, I would sum it up by saying that John Kennedy was killed because he refused to send combat troops to Vietnam. He refused to be involved in the war in Asia and would not budge from that position. And killing him, of course, opened the way to Asia. It was after his death that the half million troops were sent into Asia. And uh, I might add to that that there isn't the slightest possibility of America withdrawing from Southeast Asia. It doesn't matter the next day when I left New Orleans, I flew to New York. The plane took off, and I looked down on that city with all those bayous around it, and with all the memories of the things that have happened there, and people like Dean Andrews, Terry Russo, Jim Garrison, all these people. And I had a feeling that I was looking down on a, on a strange city from a strange planet. And then the plane turned north, and I flew back to what I call the real world. It couldn't have happened in Cincinnati. But I think if there is any saving grace in this whole thing, is that whatever the outside world thought of the city of New Orleans at that time, the fact remains that what was presented in court did not present a case on which Clay Shaw could be convicted. And to that extent, justice won out. And I think it showed the world that justice still can win out in Louisiana. Mm -hmm. It uh, was a very large and a very tragic mistake. And uh, it's something that should have never happened because uh, there's no way that Clay Shaw was or would have ever been involved in anything of this type. If there ever was a, a non-violent person in the world, it was Clay Shaw. And, uh, why this thing came about, I don't know if anyone will ever really know the true answer, but uh, what we all know and, and feel in our hearts that, uh, that certainly he was no way involved in anything like this. Clay Shaw died on August 15, 1974, slightly more than five years after his trial ended. He was 61 at the time of his death. On November 1, 1991, Jim Garrison retired from the Louisiana State Appeals Court, where he was a judge for 13 years. <laughs>